I just love Sunday mornings. I am reading the newspaper, sipping my favorite filter coffee, birds chirping, so peaceful. Yo, Appa! Who is It's me, Appa. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Appa, teach me valuation, no? Valuation, ah? You're just 10 years old. Go, do your homework. Tell me valuation. Valuation is no child's play, metaphorically speaking. But let's take it up as a challenge and try to explain it in a manner that even a 10 year old can understand. Thank you, Chittapa. You're the best. On the other hand, my appa no. Okay, okay, we don't have time for behind the scenes. So there are eight basic valuation techniques that I'll cover in this video. But let's start with a basic scenario. So imagine there is a nice shop in the neighborhood. Chittapa, are you talking about a bookshop? Yes, that's perfect. So imagine there is a nice bookshop in the neighborhood. And the big question to you is, how much will you pay for it? The first way of valuing the bookshop is on a price per square feet basis. So assuming the going rate is 10,000 rupees per square foot, and since this is a 500 square feet shop, the price of this property comes to 50 lakh rupees. It's a methodology that's used in valuing buildings, warehouses, land banks, etc., where the circle rate is multiplied by the area to arrive at the property's price. And by extension, this very approach can be used when valuing service-oriented setups like a consulting firm or an IT services company like Infosys, TCS, etc. that often bill their clients a monthly fixed amount on a per resource basis. A second valuation method and a popular one is to compare the price of a business with another one in similar settings. For example, say there is a shop just next door to a bookshop. Both properties are pretty similar in terms of dimensions, frontage, facilities, etc. Now that shop was recently sold for 70 lakhs and given this piece of information, it is highly unlikely that our bookshop owner would sell it to you for just 50 lakhs. The chances are you too will have to fork 70 lakhs for this shop and that's the comparable company valuation approach. Now something like this is very common in publicly listed companies. For example, large companies in the IT services space tend to have comparable valuations. And yes, while these numbers can be here and there over a shorter period, but over the long run, all of it kind of comes together and one can see a lot of similarities. We see this trend in larger cement companies as well, where the enterprise value to EBITDA and more specifically things like the EV per ton and EBITDA per ton are hugely comparable. If you want a more detailed understanding of the cement industry, then do watch this video and do subscribe to my YouTube channel. The third valuation technique is based on book value, which is simply the total tangible assets of a business minus its total liabilities. So in the case of our bookshop, in addition to the 50 lakh property, the shop also has some 5,000 odd books. There's a computer, there is furniture in the form of wooden shelves, tables, chairs, etc. There are other fittings like a couple of air conditioners, CCTV system, Wi-Fi, etc. So all of this put together comes to about 75 lakhs. Additionally, the shop had recently done up the interiors and had taken a small business loan which has an outstanding of 10 lakhs that needs to be paid back. So assets minus liabilities, 75 lakhs minus 10 lakhs gives us a book value of 65 lakhs. Practically, this book value concept is not useful for every kind of company. For example, asset light business models like FMCG or technology companies don't have much use for the price to book ratio. However, it is a very useful metric in valuing businesses like banks, housing finance companies, heavy industries like metal, oil and gas, in addition to utility companies like power, gas, water, etc. The fourth way of valuing a stock is by utilizing a revenue or sales multiplier. So say our bookshop sold 50 lakhs worth of books and stationery last year. Now the usual industry practice for this kind of a business is to offer a revenue multiplier of two, which means our bookshop receives a valuation of one crore. Now how this multiplier of two came about is a different story in itself and is probably the weakest link in this model. Take for instance the IPO valuations of most new age internet companies. I'm talking about the likes of Zomato, PB Fintech, Nika, Paytm, etc. And of course the much anticipated Mama Earth IPO. There is no denying that all these businesses entered the capital markets with a high sales multiplier and many retail investors who invested then are facing the brunt of it. But from a measurement front, the sales multiplier is probably the only metric available to value these new age internet companies which are still in its infancy and are generally non-profitable. And speaking of profits, the fifth way of valuing a business is using the earnings or profit multiplier. Now say our bookshop posted a net profit of 10 lakh rupees last year. 
as businesses in that area are typically offered an earnings multiplier of 12, this gives our bookshop a valuation of 1.2 crores. As an industry term, this multiplier is also known as the price earning or P ratio and gives a more accurate picture of a company's real value as compared to the revenue multiplier. In fact, the P ratio is the most commonly used valuation metric amongst investors and is often used to determine a company's relative cheapness as compared to its competitors. For example, within the footwear segment, while Relaxo and the recently IPO'd Campus Activewear have an earnings multiplier of over 100, some of the smaller companies like Shree Leather and Liberty Shoes are in a more sedate range of 20 to 30. But before we continue, let me just check on my nephew. So Kanna, how is it going so far? Super, super Chittapa. You make valuation sound so simple. Please, please continue. The next technique is the discounted cash flow method or DCF as it's commonly called. It's a concept that is based on the time value of money. For example, say I give you two options. Either you receive your salary of 5 lakh rupees now, or you have the option of receiving the same 5 lakh rupees a year later. Now I'm sure all of us would want our money now because we all understand that the 5 lakhs would be worth a lot lower a year from now. Using the same principle, let's say the bookshop owner tells you that his bookstore will generate 30 lakh rupees every year from this current year until the 5th. So 30 times 5 comes to 1.5 crores. And that's the selling price that the bookshop owner is quoting. But because you are smart and you have watched this video, you are likely to come back with a more accurate valuation of 1.13 crores on the basis of a 10% discount. Which essentially means the discounted cash flow model consists of three assumptions. One, we need to determine the number of years that business would be in existence, which in this example is five years. Number two, we need to estimate the future cash flows of the business, something that the bookshop owner is assuming to be 30 lakhs a year. And thirdly, we have to estimate a discount rate which factors important variables like the cost of capital and project risk. The DCF method is something equity analysts, private equity players, venture capitalists, investment bankers, etc. swear by. And however powerful this method is, it is not something that everyday retail investors use given its complexity in estimation and calculation. If you want to give it a try, then platforms like Phenology, TradeBrains, and Safal Niveshak do feature a DCF calculator, but in my opinion, it's a lot more fun and retentive when you do it yourself in an Excel spreadsheet. The seventh valuation technique is not a formal technique per se, but I see a growing importance of this in the way today's business is conducted. So let's say our bookshop, in addition to selling books, has also been running a book club for the last 20 years. And over the years, it has meticulously built a database of over 10 lakh book lovers, including their names, contact details, the kind of books they love to read, the money they spend every month, etc. If you are a buyer of this business, I'm sure you can understand how valuable a list like this can be. This invisible but powerful asset that a bookshop business has is what is generally referred to as an intangible business. Perhaps the best way of explaining it is to examine it within Alphabet's financial statements. So intangibles in the company's balance sheets were a mere $1.42 billion in 2021. It's a number that has been coming down over the years while the revenue has been increasing. But what might surprise you is that these intangibles, these $1.4 billion worth of intangibles include some 30,000 patents that the company has received, its in-house technology that includes the algorithm that powers Google.com and YouTube, the trade names owned by the company, and the entire know-how of AdSense, Google Maps, AdWords, Gmail, Android, etc. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this because it's actually those $1.4 billion worth of intangibles that have been powering Alphabet's billions and billions of dollars of sales, growth, and profits over the years. So as a rule and practice, always keep an eye out for intangibles when valuing a business and be ready to pounce on it if you see that it's being grossly undervalued. The liquidation value is our eighth technique. And to put it simply, a company's liquidation value is the total worth of its physical assets if it were to go out of business. For example, our bookshop has some assets within the store, things like a computer, some books, tables, chairs, fittings, etc. Now the owner bought these for about 10 lakhs, but obviously no one is going to pay us so much for these items. So it's going to be like a fire sale. And let's say this fetches us about 3 lakh rupees. So the liquidation value for a bookshop will be 50 lakhs, which is the value of the property, plus an additional 3 lakhs that we received or are likely to receive when we put this business on the block. 
Now this concept of liquidation value is very restricted in use and generally happens in bankruptcy situations like what we are seeing now with Reliance Capital and the Sri Group. But there was a time in the 1930s and 40s when Benjamin Graham advocated the use of this very approach to find extremely cheap companies. I'll have a separate video on Ben Graham and his methods. But for now, these eight valuation techniques we have discussed today concludes the basic forms of valuation that at least a beginner should know of. I mean, yes, there are more techniques like replacement costs, sum of the parts valuation, comparable private transactions, reasonable rate method, etc., which are applicable to different situations. And if any piece of content requires it, then I will touch upon those as well. But let's ask the most important question to the man of the moment. So Karna, how much of this did you understand? Yes, I understood everything, Chittapa. But tell me, when are you coming up with a detailed series on valuation? Hey, what are you doing here? Go do your homework. And Shankara, why are you spoiling my kid? But Anna, my viewers. Viewers, Yenna Peri viewers. Okay, okay, they'll come, they'll subscribe, they'll share, they will like. Now you please get out of my house. Po, po, po.